Library Services, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the library, or back to the library for some of you today. Uh, and we continue our series of A Futuristic Look Through Ancient Lenses. We're studying this month Ancient Egypt, and we have looked at the building of the pyramids last Thursday. We have looked at geological digs on Friday. Then on Monday, we had a variety of activities, including two lectures on religion and the development of religions, tracing them back to ancient Egypt. We also, that day, went into geography and geology of the country, especially attuned to ancient agriculture and other um, things that we might not know about today. We looked at documenting life since the ancient civilization times, and yesterday we went through myths of ancient Egypt. Today we studied women this morning, and the place, the role of women in ancient Egyptian society, and on a variety of levels, I might add, and they're in your program. But tonight, we're going into a new realm, and that is of medicine. So you can see, if you stick with us throughout the month, in the four or five weeks that we're studying this topic, you will see ancient Egypt from so many facets that you will have a much better understanding of the whole. And uh, tonight will be no exception. We're adding to your knowledge here. We thank the College of Sciences and the Biological Sciences Department for uh, helping us with this uh, presentation. Uh, this series, the symposium, continues throughout the month. And I uh, request that you take a program in the back and check other opportunities. We still have many things to study, and we've left out a lot. So... <clears throat> we will continue to traipse through the period. And um, to present our speaker, I would uh, introduce Dr. Wafik Wabi, an Egyptian himself, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean Lena. Thank you all for coming at this time uh, of the day. And this day of the week, uh, you have lots of things I'm sure you can do and use your time doing it, but thanks for coming. And I hope you will be rewarded as you go out of this door, uh, better persons, better knowledge, and, and no, knowing more. And uh, in continuation to what Dean Lanham said, this symposium is not intended to tell people everything because we cannot. It's just like the the chain of keys that you have, and each seminar or session, we have uh, 17 of them, and we have 24 speakers, they will give you the key to the room. So each is a key. So you like it, you take the key, and on your own, you open the door and spend as much time as you can. Uh, when I took some students back then to Egypt, I told them in 16 days, uh, you will see what other people see in 60 days because we'll start 5 o'clock in the morning, finish at 10.30 in the evening, and we'll go fast, fast, fast. Register here what you like to see in the next visit, but at least we covered a lot when we went. This is the same thing, same philosophy of uh, this symposium. Our speaker tonight is a very busy man, and uh, I didn't want to start with this because everybody is busy, but I consider Kip a blessing. I mean, uh, maybe this is the first time I say it in front of him. I said it in, on his back before, that when I see him in any place, without at a distance, I feel peace. And I feel that everything is all right. Uh, something about him peaceful. He is so, has enough in peace inside that he shines. I don't know why. I don't know how many of you do say that. Uh, but let me uh, 
uh, acknowledge uh, Carol, his wife. Thank you for coming. And let me also acknowledge uh, Harold, 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 Harold. He is a, a fan of these programs since 15 years ago. He comes and appears. And his hair didn't change a bit. Same color. <laughs> and uh, let me acknowledge Tom Woodall for taking the trouble and, and time to bring our friend. So in a nutshell, I'll not uh, say that our speaker is a great speaker or as a nice person or a busy person or a blessing or anything of these things. But I'll ask him to do the difficult task of talking about philosophy. That's not tangible. These are tangibles. But philosophy is not. It's all yours now. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Wabi is a, is a good friend of mine, and he's also a very persuasive recruiter. Uh, and so I, I want to start out by saying that I am no expert on ancient Egyptian medicine, but I do love to learn. And so this gave me an opportunity to learn many things that I will share with you, and hopefully that will encourage you to want to learn uh, new things as well, if not about this culture, uh, then about other cultures, and uh, if not about medicine, then about other fields. But uh, uh, learning is an exciting part of being in the university community, and I'm, I'm glad you're here today. So the title of my talk is The Philosophy and Practice of Ancient Egyptian Medicine. And uh, we'll just kind of take you back to ancient Egypt. My daughter, by the way, wants to visit ancient Egypt and uh, haven't been able to quite get it clear to her that maybe we have to visit modern Egypt rather than ancient Egypt. But there are opportunities, as, as this seminar, for example, uh, to do such. So this is a civilization that uh, far exceeded uh, in development uh, other groups that were uh, existing at the same time uh, elsewhere nearby. Um, and uh, we also know more about the Egyptian culture than about other cultures of that time. And there are several reasons for that. One of it is the development of language and the use of that language. Another is their, their arts and uh, the, the way that their, their works of art have persisted. Their buildings is another reason. And, uh, and some of what I'll share has been gleaned from those sources. And then the one unique source is the uh, process of preserving uh, the dead, uh, which you know about as Egyptian mummies. And so through all of this, are able to gain a lot of insight uh, into ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian medicine. Uh, We've had some excellent talks already that shared some, some aspects of this civilization, and, and I'll touch on a few of those aspects as we go through. But one thing is Egyptian society was, uh, was ruled by an absolute uh, called papyri. And, uh, uh, of course, many of those stone sculptures have survived, and miraculously some of the um, papyrus uh, uh, writings have also survived and uh, people who are quite smart have been able to uh, do very effective translations of these hieroglyphics. So from ancient writings, we're able to learn some things about the culture, including uh, the practice of medicine in, uh, in ancient Egypt. One issue that is very, was very important to Egyptians was uh, the uh, question of immortality. And immortality was a, an important part of their uh, religious beliefs, uh, so important that they took great pains to preserve bodies, to hang on to belongings. Uh, the, the, the Christian phrase is, you can't take it with you. Well, the Egyptians, I think, thought they could. Uh, and uh, although I'm not convinced that, uh, that they achieved the kind of immortality that they dreamed of, they certainly have achieved immortality in the sense of the continuing of the culture, making that available to future cultures, and even of individuals. Uh, so we know Egyptians by name from, what would it be, four, five, six thousand years ago, uh, even know their names and, and some of their characteristics. Um, Ryan McDaniel showed this very same uh, uh, picture uh, the uh, other day when uh, he talked about uh, uh, the Christian beliefs in, uh, in uh, ancient Egypt. 
And uh, this was from the Book of the Dead, not, not a Christian belief, but this is uh, uh, one of those, uh, this is a, a, an artwork on a, on a, a papyrus sheet that uh, kind of explains some of the story of the afterlife. And one of the things that he pointed out, and I wanted to reemphasize, is that this individual who is named Ani, uh, has, uh, he has passed on and he's facing the judgment day. And the scales of justice are here and there are various gods located around. And his heart is being weighed against the feather of truth. And the idea is if his heart is pure, so pure that it weighs less than the feather of truth or balances the feather of truth, then he's in and he achieves the, uh, the afterlife that he desires. But if he has anything weighing on his heart, then the balances are going to go down. Uh, one of the reasons I put this up here is because of the importance of the heart. And I'll mention that again in, uh, in just a few minutes. So, uh, in belief of the afterlife then, it was important to preserve the remains of individuals. And they, uh, the Egyptians got some clues from what happened out in the desert environment. Now, the modern Egyptian civilization developed in the Fertile Crescent along the Nile River, so uh, there was abundant water at least uh, many times, and with an irrigation system, it was a pretty green area. But you didn't have to go very far from there, and uh, you were in the, the dry desert. Well, when an animal dies in the desert, uh, its, uh, its body parts dry out pretty quickly, and sometimes it could be preserved for very long times as a consequence of that rapid drying out. So desiccation was an important part of this process of mummifying. So the mummies were uh, prepared, embalmed, placed inside of elaborate cases such as this, or sometimes more simpler devices. And uh, the desiccation process involved uh, packing the inner parts of the body with a substance called natron. And natron was a combination of sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate, and that tended to just kind of dry that, uh, that tissue right out. And this could be gleaned from the bottom of, uh, of dried out lakes that had, uh, had accumulated this, uh, this uh, uh, sodium salt. Uh, as they did this uh, embalming practice, they generally left the heart and the kidneys in place in the body. The heart, because it was so important, that was integral to that person's uh, uh, personage. The kidneys, uh, they speculate, they just sort of overlooked because they were kind of back in the back and had a, had a layer over the top of them, so they may have just not even realized they were there. But the other internal organs, uh, the lungs, the intestines, and so on, would be taken out, separated, and placed into separate jars or wrapped and, uh, and generally placed between the legs of the, uh, of the deceased. So the organs were there, but they'd been removed from the body. Interestingly, they just sucked the brains out and discarded them. They didn't see that they were of too much value. Now, there are a number of ways that you can examine mummies. And uh, one of those ways to actually perform autopsies on mummies. Now, normally an autopsy would be performed right after someone had died, but because these bodies were preserved, things could be learned through autopsy uh, afterwards. The first autopsy was performed in uh, 1825 uh, in England, the uh, first autopsy of a mummy. Uh, this is obviously a more uh, recent one. I think this is from the 1950s. And these are rarely done anymore because they're so destructive. Uh, they're invasive uh, to the, the kind of the, the sacred honor of that individual, but they're also destructive in terms of destroying uh, what has been preserved in order to uh, examine what's there and to uh, make such things as, as uh, tissue slices to examine under the microscope. So this is rarely done anymore, and fortunately there are additional techniques that can be valuable. Um, one of those uh, is x-rays. This is a, an x-ray of a very well-preserved uh, specimen. Uh, and so in this case you see the, the bones quite clearly and don't see any particular damage. Many of the skeletons were, uh, w had broken bones uh, that they were able to ascertain had occurred after uh, death. In other words, during the embalming process or basically in the process of packing people into maybe boxes that were too small for them. So often bones were broken either deliberately or accidentally in order to, uh, to pack them away. A much more modern technique, which reveals even more, is CT scans. 
And uh, uh, with a CT scan, normally done on a living individual, you're put into this box and uh, it makes a bunch of noise and it ends up giving you a, uh, a very clear uh, view and a series of slices, basically, of your body and all the soft organs. Uh, and very revealing for a living subject. For uh, Egyptian mummies, of course, many of these tissues had been removed or uh, had undergone some decay, so not quite as revealing, but still more revealing than an x-ray would be. So one of the things they uh, learned from, uh, from the mummies was examination of the bones. And uh, by examining the bones, you can see some differences in height between ancient Egyptians and modern Egyptians and modern Americans. Uh, uh, Egyptian men typically were averaged uh, five foot two inches tall, which is about four inches shorter than me. And women were about four foot ten. And uh, so my wife and I would have been a tall couple in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, this is about six inches shorter than the average modern American. Um, and an interesting thing is that the Egyptians of the dynastic era, that is the, the era of the, of the pharaohs, of the kings and the pyramids and all this, were actually about three and a half inches shorter on average than Egyptians from before the dynastic period. And the reason for this is, before the great civilization was built around the Nile Delta, um, these individuals <coughs> survived by hunting. And so they had much more protein in the diet. The dynastic Egyptians had uh, depended more on agriculture and consumption of grain. So they had a high carbohydrate diet. And protein is very important for building body structure. Uh, so they actually lost some height as a consequence of uh, a change in diet away from, uh, from protein. Another thing that might explain uh, a shortened height to some degree is the effect of disease. And x-rays would reveal shortened growth lines in individuals. Those growth lines are an indication, kind of like the rings of a tree, of bone growth, annual bone growth. And so children would frequently have, or, or uh, uh, bodies would frequently show periods of time where there was very little growth for a year or two. And that could have been due to disease, serious disease, of course, would take its toll on growth, or malnutrition. Now, since many of these mummies came from very privileged families, malnutrition was probably not <laughs> a likely cause for most of them. Uh, but disease certainly uh, would, uh, would do some stunting of the growth, diseases that with modern medicine we, uh, we avoid for the most part. Some things about the life of uh, Egyptians that came uh, uh, from, uh, from their literature as well as uh, some things that could be determined from mummies. One was the average age of marriage for men was 15 to 20 years of age. For, uh, for women, it was 12 to 13 years of age. So they kind of got started early, and that's probably a good thing because half of Egyptians died by the age of 34. Um, and of course, this is based primarily on uh, evidence from the, from the mummies, so it'll be a little bit skewed because you, you don't recover everybody's uh, remains to be able to figure out what went on. Uh, it was rare to live past the age of 50. Ninety percent were dead uh, by the age of 50, but there were exceptions to that. Uh, for example, Ramses II lived to be 92 years old, so it could be done, um, but uh, it didn't happen real often. I'm going to give you kind of an exhaustive list here of various diseases that have been diagnosed uh, in uh, mummies uh, based on their examination. And I'll explain a few of these and their significance and skip over a few others. But first of all, affecting the heart, one uh, disease is pericarditis, which is a, an inflammation of the outer uh, uh, covering of the heart. Uh, there's evidence of atherosclerosis, which is interesting for two reasons. One is we see that as a modern disease, but it was actually very common uh, back then, even though people were dying at age 50. Uh, but the other kind of puzzling thing is that the Egyptians had a high-carbohydrate diet, very little fat in their diet, and we generally associate atherosclerosis with a high-fat diet. So it didn't match up very well with that. Atherosclerosis, of course, can lead to heart attacks and to stroke. And I should point out that uh, there are many diseases that you could not really diagnose by looking at the uh, by examination of the mummies because they affect uh, body parts that, that would have decayed uh, or are complex in the, in the way they're manifested, like diabetes. It would be hard to look at a, a mummy and say, well, this one had diabetes and this one didn't. The lungs 
uh, were examined. It surprises me that there was any tissue surviving from the lungs, but they were able to find emphysema. Emphysema is a lung disease where there's a lot of scar tissue, so that may have been uh, uh, some of the reason that they were able to find it. Pneumoconiasis is uh, a, a disease of uh, basically damage to the lung by particle matter. Okay? Think about some of the um, uh, uh, things you've read about in the news with the first responders at the World Trade Center after September 11th, and many of them are developing lung disease because of the particle matter that they inhaled when the, when the buildings came down. Well, the Egyptians uh, had constant exposure to sand, and so uh, breathing sand would be pretty much a part of their lifestyle. So that would explain the pneumoconiasis. A pneumonia is uh, an infection of the lungs, uh, common in, in most civilizations, uh, uh, helped along now by antibiotics. And tuberculosis was common back then, more common than now. Uh, it also affects the bone, so it was uh, more easy to, easier to diagnose in, uh, uh, in the mummies. Kidney stones, they're going to hang around, so you'd find those uh, examining a mummy. And glomerular uh, uh, sclerosis is kind of a hardening of the blood vessels in the, in the kidneys. And this is a disease that would be associated with, with diabetes, so one piece of evidence of uh, diabetes back then. Uh, in the digestive system, most notable would be tapeworm. They found actual worms, found the eggs of the tapeworms. Uh, many of these tapeworms are uh, 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 derived from other organisms like snails, which were common in the Nile River Valley. Uh, one in particular, guinea worm, is a worm that uh, uh, begins its life in the intestines it then burrows out of the intestines and out through the skin, causing a painful eruption in the skin. Uh, and guinea worms is a disease that uh, the Carter Center, the World Health Organization, and several other organizations are teaming together right now to eliminate from the world. A very aggressive effort. Uh, I, I read um, literally an hour ago <laughs> that uh, uh, there are only three nations uh, in which that uh, guinea worm still exists, all three in Africa. Of course, you'd see evidence of bone disease, osteoarthritis, arthritis of the bones uh, uh, was, uh, was found, and also evidence of violent deaths. Uh, when you find a mummy with a crushed skull, you kind of get an idea, ah, I think what might have happened here, or, uh, or a piece of weaponry sticking out of them. Uh, that generally gives you an idea. Um, and there is, uh, was also some evidence of stroke, again, going along with the atherosclerosis. There are a few cases of cancer found in mummies. Um, one reason might be the lack of persistence of those kind of tissues, although some hard cancers uh, certainly would persist. But more likely, it was rare. Two reasons. One is they're dying at fairly young ages, and the other is they did not have the exposure to many of the environmental contaminants that we uh, are constantly exposed to in, uh, in modern society. So not much cancer. You can also learn some things about the teeth and some things about dental medicine because the teeth are well preserved in mummies. Um, they had few cavities, um, probably had, uh, had something to do with their diet once again. Um, they did show extreme wear on the crowns of their teeth, and this is because they ingested a lot of sand. Okay? Some of this would have just gotten mixed in with their food. But the other reason is that they ground their bread between, or their wheat between two stones to make bread, and so you'd have, uh, you'd have mineral material also mixed in with the bread. Well, this was a serious problem because when you wear the enamel off of the crowns of your teeth, then it's uh, prone to infection, it's very painful, um, and that often uh, could be the cause of death of individuals, is a tooth infection that, uh, that could not be, uh, be overcome. There were even a few rather creative dentists. Here is a dental bridge in a mummy. Uh, two teeth fell out and put them back in uh, using uh, a, gold, uh, a gold wire. So I'm sure that was quite a surprise when they found that one. How did they make the holes? Drills. They actually have drills. They're hand drills. Um, and yeah, they actually had, they have found drilling tools. Uh, this is, by the way, I'm watching Barb back there covering her mouth. This is, uh, this is before any kind of anesthesia, <laughs> either general or local anesthesia. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about the healers. Um, there was a therudic or upper class of healers. These were mainly priests or were designated as priests. They practiced rituals and magic. Um, they called on the gods for healing. And uh, they were kind of the upper class of, of, uh, of healers. They also would interpret the dreams of people who were ill, uh, thinking that that might provide them with some clues as to how to heal these individuals. The inferior class were the physicians. The physicians were also known as the Sunu. And uh, the Sunu sometimes practiced some of the same things as the, uh, as the priests, but they also took a more, used a more natural means of healing, which generally involves such things as uh, minor surgeries, uh, use of ointments, uh, and various kinds of medications that I'll talk about later on. So these were the, these were the doctors and these were kind of the, the priest magicians. And they sort of all worked together in society and, and uh, uh, provided what they, uh, they could to people who were ailing. Uh, the lowest ranks were the bandagers. Um, they usually learned their techniques from the embalmers and they learned uh, you know, how to bandage uh, body parts that needed fixing. And medical trainees, uh, our medical students would have been pretty low on the, uh, on the scale as they are kind of in the, in the medical establishment today. Um, both were managed by the physicians, so they didn't make their own diagnoses, or uh, they basically did what the physicians uh, recommended that they do. Well, a concept of dualism is important in talking about uh, ancient Egyptian medicine because what we saw was a transition from this magical treatment of disease to a more rational treatment of disease. And often the two would get all intertwined with each other. So you would use both magical remedies as well as uh, uh, re remedies that had a more natural uh, approach all at the same time. Two main causes of illness were recognized. One is displeasure of the gods. You displeased the gods, so they made you ill. And the other is that there were also natural causes. And so again, you just had sort of a mix of those causes. A very famous name in the history of medicine is Imhotep. Imhotep is the first physician known to history. This is a drawing of, of him. Uh, he was born around 2650 B.C. in Memphis. That's not in Tennessee, in, in Memphis, uh, Egypt. Yes? Was he like um, the inferior class physician? Or he, he was more of a priestly physician, yes. He was more of a priestly physician. Um, and, but he, he had some, some natural aspects to his, uh, to his healing. Uh, he served the Pharaoh Djoser, uh, who's, who uh, was Pharaoh for about 20 years. And he served both as the Pharaoh's physician and also as his chief architect. If you attended the uh, earlier seminar that was uh, given by Dr. James Hoffmeyer, he talked about Imhotep being um, uh, the architect uh, and builder of the first, not by himself, of course, but the builder of Egypt's first, or the world's first pyramid. And this is the step pyramid at Saqqara, which was built for, uh, for Djoser. After his death, he was elevated to the status of an Egyptian god. So he went from being uh, a true living individual uh, to someone recognized as a god of medicine. Uh, many uh, hundreds of statuettes like this with uh, Imhotep, uh, sitting, holding a scroll, because he was also a scribe, uh, honored him. Most of these, all of these, were made hundreds of years after his death, so they don't actually represent what he actually looked like, but uh, uh, just uh, someone's attempt to uh, 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 deify him. He was also commemorated in a 1928 stamp in Egypt. This was a stamp honoring the, con the International Congress of Medicine and also celebrating the 100th uh, cent centenary of the uh, medical school in Cairo. There also were female physicians, uh, and this is unusual in these cultures and, and these times. Uh, Pesachet, who is, uh, is drawn here, is recognized as the earliest known female physician, uh, and her role was described as overseer of the female physicians. So she was, uh, she was kind of in charge there are more than 100 prominent female physicians who are, are, uh, are named by various uh, uh, um, scrolls uh, in, in history. 
Now, some interesting things about anatomy and physiology, and, and by the way, I was introduced as being in the biological sciences department, which I am, but uh, what I enjoy teaching and what I spend most of my time teaching is physiology, so this part was especially of interest to me. Uh, the process of embalming offered the opportunity to study the internal organs uh, in a way that otherwise would not have been pro provided. It was uh, because of the high elevation or the, the, the high status of the dead, uh, it, was, it was thought not, uh, not right to do autopsies or to do uh, any kind of examination of bodies after they died, except in the process of embalming. So some things could be learned uh, during this process. Clearly the heart was the most important organ in the body. And uh, it serves as the seat of intelligence uh, and of emotion. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the brain was not seen to be of, of, of any importance. Uh, one individual did recognize that when there was brain damage, people sometimes had trouble walking. So they saw a connection there, but, but uh, that was about as far as it went. Air was recognized as vital to life. Of course, this is thousands of years before oxygen was discovered. Uh, and the scheme that was laid out was the air passes through the trachea and the heart and uh, then in, and, uh, into the heart and the lungs. And then it passes from the heart and the lungs through the blood to other organs called metu. And then from the metu, it flows through secondary metu, which would be smaller vessels, to the surface of the body, where this would then be released as sweat or tears or semen or urine. So basically, they saw a flow that started out really pretty accurate until you get to those very tiny blood vessels, and then they had them going out the skin instead of, uh, of the blood circulating. You've got to remember, no microscopes at that time either. Uh, it would be thousands of years before uh, the capillaries would be identified. Um, disease was thought to be transported as a foul substance called eukadu to the various organs. And when you think about the things that smell the foulest about the human body in life and in death, you kind of get an idea of where they got this idea of the eukadu. So the goal of healing then was to expel the eukadu, uh, and a good way to do that would be through the feces. Pus was recognized as the eukadu trying to get out of the body, trying to escape from the body. And so the drainage of pus was encouraged, which turns out to be a good idea. So the buildup of eukadu in the organs, even a slow buildup, leads to decay of the flesh, which we know now as aging. Uh, and so it was routine for people to take laxatives, get those eukadu out through the feces so they didn't build up and cause our bodies to decay internally. Now, much of what we know about the healing arts, most of what we know about the healing arts, uh, comes from uh, various uh, written documents, various papyruses, and I'm going to mention a few, but certainly not all of them. Uh, one was called the Cahoon Papyrus, and I mention this uh, because it's recognized as the oldest uh, medical papyrus, um, and this was from 1800 BC, and it uh, focused primarily on gynecological diseases, and on pregnancy. Uh, I'll mention a couple things that came from that as well as other sources later on. The Hearst Papyrus, uh, according to what I read, is actually older, 2000 BC, but uh, it, there are doubts as to its authority. And one of the reasons for those doubts is the incredibly good condition that it is in. But nonetheless, it contained many magical remedies that were consistent with other documents uh, from the time. So perhaps it was a more modern copy of a more ancient document, uh, hard to tell. Now, belief in the supernatural was very important. Um, and uh, there were no hospitals in ancient Egypt, but temples were places of healing. So people would go to the temple in, uh, in search of help uh, from the uh, physician uh, and physicians and priests. I won't, I won't share all of the things about the supernatural because I don't know them, but I, I'll share w uh, one interesting family. Uh, and uh, this is Isis, uh, kind of a Mother Earth god, and uh, Osiris, uh, who was a sun god. 
and together they created agriculture and the medical arts. And by the way, now we're in the area of myth. These are not real individuals who live, but, uh, but gods who were uh, in Egyptian, Egyptian mythology. They had a son named Horus, and Horus had healing powers and had the gift of prophecy. So it was common in places of healing to have statues of Horus. Uh, many of them had Horus standing on a crocodile, um, and I didn't get, quite get the connection of that one. I'm still kind of curious about that one. Now, uh, Isis was uh, important because she uh, reassembled the parts of her husband, Osiris, when he was hacked to pieces by his evil brother. And that's pretty impressive healing powers, to be able to put someone together after they've been hacked apart. Uh, so she became one of the gods of heal goddesses of healing. And their son Horus also had his own powers uh, that came kind of the hard way. Uh, one thing was he was bitten by a snake when he was young. And uh, he was then healed by another healing god named Toth. And from that point on, he was immune to snake bite. So he was, uh, he was one that they frequently uh, turned to uh, for healing, uh, or his, his image, uh, his statue, for example, for healing of snake bites. He also is reported to have uh, had an eye destroyed in a battle, and that eye was uh, restored back to health as well. So he's also the patron god of, uh, of uh, eye doctors. Um, so uh, Horace had kind of a rough time of it. Uh, again, this is in mythology. Uh, but he always was healed, he always bounced back, and so he was recognized as a very important figure in healing. Amulets were often worn or carried by individuals uh, to help them either ward off diseases or to provide, um, to provide uh, healing for diseases. Here are some examples of museum pieces, uh, really beautiful pieces of art, um, showing different body parts or our animals, uh, hippopotamus and beetles there. The Taueret is kind of interesting. This is, a, this is a figure of a hippo standing upright, and Taueret was the goddess of fertility. Uh, so you, and uh, there's Horus and Isis, and I never did figure out who that, that third person was, but I think it's somebody's sister. Um, now, not only were there supernatural uh, uh, reasons for or ways of healing or, or beliefs about healing, but also there were natural means. And many of these natural means appeared with the Edwin Smith papyrus. And by the way, each of these papyruses is named not after the writer, obviously, but after a person who uh, revealed this papyrus to civilization, usually received it as a gift or purchased it um, at a flea market and realized it was of great uh, value to society. So the Edmund Smith, Edwin Smith papyrus comes from about 1600 BC. And this was the first of the literature to contain a rational scientific approach to medicine. Uh, it talked about surgical practices, generally pretty minor surgery, but it also pointed out that doctors tended to specialize. So uh, generally speaking, you were a doctor of eyes or of hands, or of feet, or of, uh, of the bowels. So uh, the, the, the doctors had various specialties. And you can see this one, papyrus, was in pretty good shape. Um, there are surgical tools that have been recovered. Uh, evidence, of course, uh, that surgery uh, really did occur uh, in those ancient Egyptian times. Uh, here are a couple of examples, or a variety of examples, of surgical tools. And one of the first recorded types of surgery was circumcision. Uh, this was uh, found painted on the walls of the tomb of Ankh Mahor, and it involves two uh, uh, adolescent boys being circumcised, and uh, it has various quotations around there, which is the dialogue, kind of like the comic strip balloons that go along with that. So one of them is saying, for example, hold him fast, don't let him fall. Most of the surgeries, though, involve, and I should mention, circumcision was, was not done to infants in ancient Egypt, but was done at the age, at the time of puberty. And it was done for both health and perhaps supernatural uh, uh, religious reasons. Most surgery involved repairing of wounds of some kind, and so the Egyptians were skilled at splinting broken bones, at uh, stitching cuts, and at bandaging wounds and there are instructions in these papyruses about how to do those. 
There even were prosthetics. This is another one of those amazing mummy finds, an artificial big toe that uh, a, uh, obviously a, probably a very well-to-do Egyptian carried to his grave. I don't remember exactly who that was, but pr even prosthetics was practiced. Obstetrics and gynecology is important in any culture because it has to do with maintaining the reproductive ability of women and, uh, and uh, caring for um, the birth of children. Um, and so I mentioned the, the one papyrus that, uh, that emphasized that area in particular. So uh, some of the areas that where medicine was practiced, of course, various diseases of the female reproductive tract. Uh, there were fertility aids, uh, things that could be taken or practices or chants that would aid in uh, increasing fertility. There were contraceptives at that time. Uh, and uh, one of the contraceptive methods was for a woman to drink a mixture of beer, celery, celery and oil uh, four days in a row at the proper time, and uh, that was supposed to uh, help provide contraception. Sometimes substances were applied to the vagina to increase the acidity of the vagina. Now, they probably didn't know what was going on there, but sperm actually do not do well in an acidic environment, so uh, it, uh, it had its effectiveness. Uh, one of these preparations was a wad of crocodile dung mixed in sour milk, so it blocked the sperm and provided the acid environment. Probably those medical trainees were the ones who went out and got the crocodile dung, I would guess. Uh, they had pregnancy tests. Uh, one was described that has been tested in modern times and found to be 70% uh, effective. Uh, I don't remember the details, but uh, it basically had to do with the woman peeing on a uh, patch of, uh, of uh, uh, seeds, different kinds of grass seeds. And if one kind grew up, uh, she was going to have a boy. If the other kind grew up, she was going to have a girl, and if nothing grew, she was uh, she was infertile. She was uh, she was not pregnant. I shouldn't say infertile. She was not pregnant. Turned out to be 70% effective in this modern test in predicting pregnancy, and it was about 50% effective in uh, determining the gender of the child. So not too bad. Got to think about that one for a minute. <laughs> Sagging breasts. Even that uh, had uh, there was a cure offered. And it was to smear the blood from a pre-pubertal female onto the breasts. Apparently, they thought that uh, uh, that would contain some uh, healing device that would euthen up the breasts. Childbirth was an interesting process in ancient Egypt. Uh, it was generally done uh, sitting on a birthing stool, usually made of bricks. So it was in an upright position. You got, had the benefit of gravity at work in this case. And uh, the person was, uh, was not attended by a physician, but would be helped by midwives or by uh, relatives. And I wanted to share a story about that from the Bible. Um, you may be familiar with the story of Moses and uh, uh, his, uh, his being sent down the Nile River on, uh, in a basket uh, in early in the book of Exodus. But there's a story that immediately precedes that story. And uh, it had to do with, uh, uh, it's in Exodus 1, verses 15 through 21. And uh, it, it tells about the oppression of the Israelites uh, who were living in the land of Egypt at that time uh, through slavery and through forced labor. And the king was concerned because they were growing in population uh, at a very rapid rate. And he was afraid they were going to become too powerful and either leave or, or, or overtake the state. And so... He wanted to destroy the male children. And so he asked the, the, the leaders of the Hebrew midwives that when a woman, a Hebrew woman was on the birthing stool to watch her, and if she gave birth to a boy child, to kill the child. If she gave birth to a girl child, she could let it live. Okay? And so the midwives reported back to the, uh, to the king, and apparently they didn't do very well at this task. Uh, because what they said is to the king, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So they were probably lying, um, but at any rate, they gave credit to the vigorousness of the Hebrew women that they were not able to catch them on the birthing stool and, uh, and destroy the male children. So then the king went to plan B, which was just to go after male babies uh, much later after they were born, and that's where Moses had to escape. Uh, from his family. Another story for another time. 
Now, mothers typically nursed for about three years after giving birth, and uh, when one is lactating, generally they don't ovulate, so are less likely to become pregnant. And so this naturally spaced the children uh, three or four years apart. And the average Egyptian family was not real large. Uh, would, a woman would typically have, have four children. Um, so uh, natural, natural birth control once the first child is born. Uh, there was quite a list of medicinal remedies that are uh, available, um, and uh, many of these are listed in another papyrus called the Ebers papyrus, as well as many others. Uh, the Ebers papyrus is uh, considered to be the oldest complete medical book in the world. Uh, this was actually 110 pages in length. It contains 700 different magical formulas and uh, remedies using uh, uh, natural products. Uh, Whoever transcribed that uh, it didn't really get the complete story because they seem to have stopped at about here uh, on their way down through the body, working through the various uh, body parts and organ systems, and they gave a hint that they had more to write. So apparently the rest of the body was lost uh, from these papyruses. So it would have been an even lengthier and more complete medical, medical book if it had survived. The prescriptions that were included in this medical book, as well as the Hearst papyrus, uh, included the name and the amount of the ingredients that were used, uh, directions for preparing the medicine, and instructions for taking the medicine for the patient. Uh, various routes of administration were used, but the main one by far was ointments. Uh, uh, ointments that would be spread on uh, the, the skin or placed in the eye or uh, in the various orifices uh, to treat whatever diseases uh, were occurring in those places. There also were some oral medications, medications that would be taken uh, by mouth. The main solvents that were used are listed here. Water, of course, is an excellent solvent. Honey was very commonly used as a solvent in ancient Egypt, and it was thought to have healing powers by itself, even without the additional ingredients. And as a matter of fact, it does have uh, antibactericidal properties. The reason is honey uh, contains a very high concentration of sugar. And when you place that uh, on living tissue, it tends to dry up those tissues. And that would include bacteria that were exposed to it. So it would tend to kind of drain the water out of these organisms. Uh, beer, why not? Uh, vegetable oils and animal fats were also used. Some of the active ingredients... One of the most common active ingredient is called jarret, uh, and no one has been able to uh, definitively translate what this plant material was. So we really don't know what it was, but it was used for treatment of diarrhea uh, and for the treatment of eye problems. Very commonly used uh, plant material. Frankincense you may have heard of from the Christmas story. Um, and uh, frankincense is an aromatic resin from the Boswellia, tree pictured uh, up above and the resin is shown down below and it's known to have analgesic properties that is to uh, to deaden pain and uh, it was uh, applied to the head uh, or the limbs for uh, for the treatment of pain. Castor bean uh, we know this in the form of castor oil but uh, these beans were used as a laxative they come from the ricinus uh, plant uh, it was generally used topically uh, or, I mean, it was also used tox topically besides being used as a laxative. And uh, Dr. Carl's word tells me that this is a very, very toxic bean, uh, so not to be trifled with in terms of uh, using the proper dose. Aloe was uh, used for its healing properties. Uh, you may be familiar with that because aloe vera is uh, her an herb that is uh, used in, in many uh, uh, topical uh, preparations that people use today for their skin. Uh, it was used at that time for eye problems. And interestingly, it was thought to convert immortality because there were drawings of aloe plants in many of the temples uh, and, and inscriptions having to do with immortality. Figs uh, were uh, consumed for, mixed with uh, other medications for treatment of abdominal pains, for urinary tract disorders, and effective in hippopotamus bites. A uh, plant called colocynth, which is kind of a cucumber-like plant, uh, was a very strong laxative. 
and uh, it also was used to perform uh, uh, chemical abortions because it caused such strong uh, contractions of the uterus. So uh, it was just kind of a brutal medication. Uh, but if you really needed a strong laxative or you wanted to perform an abortion, uh, it would be effective. There were some uh, products derived from animals. I'll just mention a few. Uh, the semen from a stallion could be taken to restore sexual drive. Um, raven's blood was used to treat hair problems. Remember, the Egyptians all had dark, uh, dark hair. Uh, fish skulls uh, were utilized for uh, treatment of headache. And pig eyes were ground up with other things uh, for treatment of blindness. Malachite is an interesting one. This is a copper salt that was ground up and used for green eye shadow. It's a, it's a very, very beautiful stone. And uh, it was mined in that area. And it was noticed that the miners did not seem to succumb to epidemics that sometimes came through the area. And so it began to be uh, recommended to use malachite as a topical uh, um, uh, medication uh, to ward off uh, epidemic diseases. And it was used only topically. Um, and people also wore beautiful malachite jewelry. Uh, and it was thought that that would uh, also provide some protection. It, it takes me back to my grandmother who wore about six copper rings on, uh, on her hands because uh, she believed that copper uh, warded off arthritis. Uh, so we continue to see some healing uh, powers of copper and indeed it has antibactericidal uh, effectiveness. I'm going to close with some medical advice that comes from uh, some of these writings um, that we can all take to heart in one way or another. Uh, first one, do not slight a small illness for which there is a remedy. Use the remedy. Another one which uh, is very important in the use of antibiotics today, do not say my illness has passed, I will not use medication. You've given all those antibiotics, you take the full course. Okay? Uh, useful, useful advice for today. The next one, um, you can see the medical establishment hasn't changed much. A remedy is effective only through the hand of its physician. Um, the supernatural aspect, a timely remedy is to prevent illness by having the greatness of the God in your heart. And for those of us who are getting older, do not be despondent when you are ill. Your death is not made yet. And for those of you who are younger, do not pamper yourself when you are young, lest you be weak when you are old. Now, because we're doing this in a library, I did want to share some of the resources that I use, certainly not all of them, but the top two are both books that are available here in Booth Library as soon as I turn them back in. Um, <laughs> Daily Life of Ancient, Egypt's, uh, of Ancient Egyptians had just one chapter on medicine and mathematics, but it was a very informative chapter and the other chapters covered the various other topics that people have been uh, talking about during this uh, seminar. And uh, this uh, illustrated history of nursing was also quite excellent with just a few pages, very well written about Egyptian culture. Uh, so if any of you are in the nursing field, this is an interesting book to look at. Interestingly, after sharing all this information about medicine in ancient Egypt, they said there was no evidence that there was nursing at that time but we all know that civilization could not survive without nurses. So certainly there was one form of nursing if, if it was not uh, described by a name that we recognize. And finally, this book, thanks to the Interlibrary Loan Department, came all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, after it had been discarded from a library in Houston some years ago. And I was very grateful to have that because this medical skills book provided me with a lot of valuable information. So I will close there and invite any, uh, any questions that you have. Give him a hand, please. And uh, as you see, uh, we have five minutes to go to 8 o'clock, and I know you have other things to do. So in the five minutes, we want to do lots of things. So first, if you have a big wow in your mouth, it is time to say it when I point at you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Say after me if we agree. Thank you, Dr. McGilliard. Thank you, Dr. McGilliard. For accepting to speak to us. 
<laughs> you are too kind. <laughs> <laughs> and why? I mean, this, this would sound egoistic. Say thank you, Dr. Wabi. Thank you, Dr. Wabi. For being so persistent. <laughs> <laughs> and again, back to him, thanks for accepting. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, no amount of pers persistence would do unless the humble scientist, the giant, would accept and give us this. And he does it so humbly and in sweet serving spirit. And I guess this could go to CAA, uh, the CAA, and have a course for three credit hours. Students can study this. Oh, don't you wish you could get three credits for being here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Questions? Comments? Yes. Is there any way to know the difference between illnesses and accidents? In other words, did the literature give you any clue as to how many people died from accidents, infections, for example, or whatever? I, I got that. This, uh, this kind of literature was more about individual cases or remedies, so it really didn't provide that kind of statistical look. Perhaps uh, from some other sources you could find information like that. It's interesting because Imhotep, besides being in the king's court, also was supervising this big pyramid scheme. <laughs> and uh, obviously there would have been a lot of accidents in the construction of those kind of things, and he may have learned some things from that. But it's easy to tell from looking at remains of mummies whether they had succumbed to a disease or an accident. But the actual statistics, I couldn't tell you that from the mummies of the royal family. Uh, there were a few that died from violence, but most of them appeared to have died from natural causes. Thanks. Other question or comments? Okay, if you have more questions that will come to you after, please email him or email me or email Dean Lanham. Yes, because we'll put this online and we'll take your questions. He will answer them and we'll put them online like a big blog or something. So many people who missed this class or this session or this uh, whatever you call it uh, would benefit of it and maybe a reminder for you if you didn't take notes. Any last words for anybody, Dean Lanham, anything? No, just to thank our... Dr. McGillier, uh, for being with us uh, this evening and sharing so much in a short period of time. Thank you for being such a nice audience.